move on to USA to hear from Ms. Andrea, the Executive Director for the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District. She has been with the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District since 2003 and as Executive Director since 2016. Uh, Andrea has vast experience in dengue control in the Florida Keys for more than a decade. And together with Addis Aegypti Control, she is also involved in programs to control other than Addis Aegypti species. Andrea, the mic is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I really appreciate um, being able to come and talk to all of you about the little islands in the Florida Keys um, where we have started to see dengue cases occurring um, in the last uh, 20 years or so. So I'll take you kind of through how we were controlling dengue and really the use of our wide area larvicide spraying um, throughout the Florida Keys. So just a little bit of background. Um, you can see the Florida Keys are located at the southernmost tip of the state of Florida in the United States. Um, we are a long island chain. We have about 1,700 islands, but only 42 of those are connected by bridges. Um, and we have, we're about 350 square kilometers in length. Um, our district itself is responsible solely for mosquito control. Um, we're what is called a special taxing district. Um, so we do have a board of elected officials that set our budget every year, and our sole purpose is to control mosquitoes. Um, we have about a $15 million operating budget, uh, 70 employees, half of which are inspectors, um, and we really do our best to uh, control mosquitoes to protect the environment as well as the tourist economy in the Florida Keys. So the Florida Keys are really quite diverse. Um, we're made up of very urbanized areas, but we also have um, about 90% of that land that I was just talking about is protected lands, um, environmentally sensitive, either designated by the state of Florida or federally designated as environmentally sensitive. So it really is a couple of really different techniques when we're looking at controlling mosquitoes throughout the Florida Keys. Um, as you can see here, the majority of the mosquitoes that we collect are what's called the salt marsh mosquitoes, the Aedes tenerinchus. Only about 2% of our collections um, of all the mosquitoes that we trap are Aedes aegypti, but that Aedes aegypti makes up for more than 10% of our annual mosquito control budget and about half of our chemical budget. Um, so as you can see, we really do a lot to make sure we're controlling those Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Um, and this is really why um, we in the Florida Keys and actually in Florida had not seen cases of locally acquired dengue um, since the 1930s. Um, and then fast forward to 2009, and we started seeing locally acquired cases pop up um, in Key West specifically. Um, I'm sure, uh, as we all know, the number of cases of dengue throughout the world have continued to rise, um, so we're going to see more introductions. So as long as we have those 80s aegypti mosquitoes, we're going to continue seeing potential locally acquired cases. Um, so this really was the impetus of what started um, our real focus on 80s aegypti control. Um, prior to this, we were really concerned with mainly nuisance mosquitoes. Um, we did have a large number of inspectors, but you you know, most of their day was spent going through salt marshes looking for mosquitoes and treating them. Um, so we really had to step up what we were doing in the Florida Keys um, when these dengue cases first started. So you can see in 2009 and 2010, we had an, an outbreak of just under 100 locally acquired cases. And then again in 2020, we saw locally acquired cases actually on the opposite end of the Florida Keys in Key Largo. So it is something that we're constantly concerned with. So what we did really when we first started, um, again, our, our first bout with dengue fever since the 1930s, is it was all hands on deck. Um, this again is in 2009. And these next few slides will kind of take you through what we did every single day, which was going to every single house that we possibly could, treating any standing water, um, doing adulticide, handheld adulticide treatments, um, mainly ULV treatments, um, and then trying to educate the public. 
Um, so you can see we're going through the city of Key West, um, really focusing in on the areas of concern, which are highlighted in yellow. Um, and just really covering the entire island with all of our inspectors. Um, we were lucky that we had the number of inspectors that we did. Um, we pulled in all of our employees and for about six weeks straight, um, every single day, 10 hour days, including weekends, we were out going through all of these neighborhoods. Um, you know, by the end of it, again, it's extremely labor intensive. It was a lot of work. And what we found is that, you know, those, re those repeated sweeps of those in high interest areas, while they did help in eliminating larvae, uh, people did not like seeing us on their property once a week. Um, we don't have those, um, those laws in place that will allow us to get onto properties and do what we need to do necessarily unless we have a declared emergency. So the residents didn't necessarily like us coming on their property. Another thing that we saw by going to these households every single week is that we weren't getting the community support necessarily that we needed, right? Um, you would go, you would flip over a bucket, come back the next week, the bucket is turned back over and is breeding mosquitoes once again. So it was, it was quite disheartening um, just focusing on this technique solely. As far as control of adults went, we did have great control using those handheld ULV foggers as pictured here um, in the bottom right. Uh, we did not find that aerial and truck adult deciding worked very well for us during this time frame. Um, and during this time frame, we also discovered um, the amount of resistance that we were starting to see in our population to pyrethroids. So again, that threw another wrench into trying to control these mosquitoes. So at the end of the day, we added additional personnel. Um, we added 10 new inspectors. What we found is that when we weren't all hands on deck, it takes about a month to get to every single location throughout the Florida Keys. And so, you know, the age old question is, how can we treat everything at once? We get a significant amount of rainfall. And if it takes us a month to get for, to every single place after that rainfall, you know, what exactly are we doing? So we really started brainstorming, what, what can we do? What can we add into all of these other things that we're currently doing that could really help us um, cover a larger area? And that enters into the aerial application of back-to-back -back WDG using the WALS technology. Um, <clears throat> when we, we had, we have helicopters, we have four helicopters and two airplanes. So we had the capacity to be able to do something like this. Um, when we first started talking, we were even discussing potentially putting out granular larvicide over residential areas. Um, glad that we kind of squashed that since that may have been a nightmare for us. Um, but this liquid BTI over residential areas was really a game changer for us. Um, when we first started looking at this, I know we worked very closely with Selena and the Valent team, um, but, you know, we had never done anything like this in the United States, um, but we were really interested to have that rapid coverage, um, wondering could this treat those containers that maybe we couldn't find. Uh, <clears throat> it also was very specific. Again, we're in the Florida Keys, so we're surrounded by a um, national marine sanctuary, so what we're putting out um, into the environment is extremely important. So we wanted to make sure if we were doing um, wide area spraying that it was with a product that was very specific. Um, so again, we were, we were excited to try this out. So we started these discussions um, right after our dengue outbreak back in 2010. It was a great theory, but did it translate? Um, and so the next few slides, I'll take you through kind of all of the work that we put into this. Um, we began again in 2010, doing some initial cup trials, um, and we did find very good mortality in those initial cup trials. And those were just placed um, you know, out in the open. So after we knew, okay, it does get to the ground, it is making a difference, what about real life scenarios? So we had our inspectors go around, um, leave larvae in the field, go ahead and treat it, and then come back and check it after that treatment. And again, saw excellent larval mor mortality after 24 hours. So those initial, um, those initial studies 
said, okay, let's, let's do this. This is something that could actually make a difference for us. So we went ahead and purchased all of the equipment that we need for, for operations. Um, the systems that we're using are an isolare spray system with Micronair spray heads. <clears throat> we have a mixed truck set up so we can mix large quantities of the um, VectVac WDG with water. And then we continued working um, on, on making sure that this was, this was making a big difference for us. So you can see the next few studies that we did, we did um, hidden cup trials where we were um, hiding cups uh, in very dense vegetation. <clears throat> we were checking container indices, also looking at overall adult control, you know, um, how about these treated areas versus areas that we weren't treating? And we did find that we were reducing our adult population by about 50%. Um, and then found that when it comes to large and small containers, there really was no significant difference um, in the control. So, you know, excellent results throughout this time frame. <clears throat> So our current setup is, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. We have a 200 foot lane separation on our helicopter. We fly at a hundred foot altitude. The blades are a pitch of 40 and then we fly at about 80 miles an hour. Um, what we found in the Florida Keys, they're very used to our helicopters. So we really didn't have any sort of public pushback by flying over residential areas. Um, and again, found excellent control, which is why we continued using this. <clears throat> Currently, our aerial WDG missions are rain dependent, so we look for about an inch of rainfall, especially in the Key West area. So we're, we're still really focusing on the Key West area. Um, that is where we're seeing um, most of our travel related cases. That's where we had our dengue outbreak in 2009 and 2010. Um, so we do really focus still in that area. However, um, you know, again, in 2020, we did have about 70 locally acquired cases on the other end of the Florida Keys as well. So we have started doing more applications in some of those other areas that we think, you know, we may see these introductions. Um, and again, this is great for any areas that we're seeing high vector numbers as well. So um, again, I'm, I'm going to reiterate what we just heard. There is no silver bullet when it comes to 80s Egypti control, right? What we need to do is we need to do everything that's available to us. Um, so um, we've continued to do all of the other things that we were doing before we added this aspect. Um, again, added more inspectors. We're focusing on larger containers in these areas um, and really working on source reduction, um, directly applying long-term larvicides, whether it's spinosad or methoprene, um, and still continuing handheld ULV applications of adulticide, um, mainly using <clears throat> malathion. We have a very robust education um, as well. We go to business owners, homeowners, we speak wherever people will listen to us, and we're still hoping that we can get, you know, that public buy-in. Um, unfortunately, you know, being a special taxing district can work against us um, because people, you know, pay for our services. So then they expect us to be out there and provide those services instead of them actually walking around their property and helping us out as well. So we're really still trying to work on that combination. Um, we are doing ground truck um, applications of this as well and find that that is working to really pinpoint those um, high vector neighborhoods. Uh, and then as far as aerially, we're continuing that uh, aerial larviciding, but we're coupling it with adult deciding when we see Oh, Andrew, we lost you there suddenly. I think I'm back. Am I back? Yes, you're back. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. All right, let's see if we can pop right back in. Sure. Okay, how are we? Are we good? Yep. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. I'll blame my kids. I think they're on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Okay, so... Um, 
The aerial work, we are treating about 20,000 acres a year. Um, I do expect that to continue to increase again because we're seeing more and more travel related cases of dengue and more introductions into the Florida Keys. Um, but what we have seen is that, you know, those adult, adult numbers have really drop down. So we're only doing about one aerial adult aside mission over Key West every year. So we are finding that the combination is making a big difference for us. There she goes. Okay. Um, and so you can kind of see uh, the catch rate is, is a little jumbly, but I'll get back into that a little bit more. But when you look at the house index, which are the percent of Aedes aegypti positive inspections, you can really see a reduction um, from 2010 um, down to current. So we are seeing that that larva sighting is making a big difference when it comes to the number of Aedes aegypti larvae that we're finding. And then really drilling down into those, the Key West 80s Egypti adult catch rate. 2010, again, was the year that we had um, the outbreak. And you can see, um, you know, our average is the black line. So it's much less. Our average isn't even really getting to our threshold, which is 10 80s Egypti per trap per night. Um, we did hit that a couple of times last year, but again, that's, that's really the average for us. So we are seeing a huge difference in the total number of 80s Egypti where we're really focusing on, you know, all aspects, including that aerial application of liquid larvicide. Um, and then just again, to reiterate, when we're combining that with adulticide, um, we are getting a, a pretty major knockdown of those 80s Egypti. Some other uses that we've done recently, um, we have had invasive species introductions. So 80s albopictus is not um, found normally in the Florida Keys. We have found it, um, went through and did a number of these ground treatments and um, you know, have eliminated it where we found it. Um, again, those ground treatments are great for being able to really hone in on small areas, areas um, that you may be just responding to disease or high vector population. So again, this is something that we're gonna continue to expand upon. Um, and with that, I just wanted to acknowledge all of the staff that have spent countless hours and years on this and, and that the Valent Biosciences team that has really helped us out. So thank you all.